morning. Today's reading comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22. Coming to Christ. So then remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision. A physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have brought together, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall. That is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility filled him. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. For Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone. In him the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So as I continue um, with the scripture that I started uh, with last week, I just wanted to do a little uh, recapping and with this full message of Ephesians is saying, and, uh, last week as I was sharing the scripture, I was talking about how often people can get into debates, um, biblical debates using fragments of the scripture. We can say these little catchphrases, bumper sticker, if you will, and uh, we can use it to either defend our theology, defend our beliefs, defend, defend the way we think the world it should run, and um, correct others and how we feel like perhaps they're wrong. But all too often, often if, is it not true? If we don't see the fullness of, of a conversation, the fullness of a, our education, then we find ourselves having just enough ammo to, um, to be giving a lot of uh, false information, not seeing the full picture. We see this in our culture today in the digital age, do we not? Right? We're in a, I remember a couple of years back, a late year back, I was in class and the professor was sharing about how we, we can basically find anything that we want to find on the internet to reinforce what we already believe. Right? Right, Chuck? And there's the guy right there. <laughs> if we believe it, we can find it in the way that our technology is set up today. And it's true, it's true. There's some fascinating, actually fascinating documentaries on this where people actually put it out there and said, what would happen if I pretended to be someone else? And next thing they know, their Twitter feed, their Facebook feed, all these different um, sources of where we get our information begin to change, right? And, and it, see, he said, I started getting fed all this information that I have never saw before. And he said, and honestly, I started to change the way I felt on something. Today's scripture in Ephesians, what I love about it is it's a full message. It's not little news spurts, right? You ever, see, you ever see on Twitter or Facebook when someone will have a title and then everybody will respond to the title and not too far in the comment will say, did you even read the article or are you only responding to the title? What's so beautiful about Ephesians is we have this fullness, this fullness. And it's a little theological, theologically complicated, and last week I went into it, and I'm not going to go into it today, the first half of it being Children's Sunday, but I thought it was appropriate that we continue for the kids. I bet you guys at times have recognized the feeling of being an insider versus being an outsider. Maybe you felt like you're with the cool kids, or sometimes you're not with the cool kids. You ever feel that way? Do you ever feel like you're in a group and then other times you're outside of a group? Like, no, when you're in baseball, I bet you feel like an insider, right? But when you showed up your first day to perhaps a new sport, maybe you felt a little bit like an outsider. Like maybe that time when you played soccer for a little while, right? <laughs> hey. <laughs> but you kids see what I'm saying? And, and before you know it, we're enjoying summer, right? We're going to be entering August. 
and then the ha happiest time of the year comes upon us in September when you guys will be back in school. And some of you will be going to a new grade, right? Some of you will be starting kindergarten. Some of you will be starting first grade. Maybe some of you will be starting mid middle school and some of you will continue in high school. And if you, you're starting what grade? Third grade, so you're an insider. You see, because you went from first grade to second grade to third grade, you're an insider. But those that are starting the kindergarten, they might feel a little nervous, right? Well, that's what Ephesians is talking about, and you're not. That's good. <laughs> Ephesians is talking about this message. And this story, this book in the Bible is reminding us that we, come to, that we are united through Christ. One of the things that I've said that so often happens, I mentioned this last week's um, sermon, one of the things in our culture today that we can also often identify people as outsiders will hear that little tidbit, God helps those who help themselves. And I think this is a very dangerous scripture reading because I know that when I look at my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I see a living Savior who helped me where I could not help myself. So for me, the gospel, that word meaning good news message of Jesus Christ, is that Jesus can into my life, continues to come into my life where I need help, where I'm not good enough, where I just can't do it. And through that, I see that God loves me, cares for me, and then lifts me up and elevates me. Right? So we have our balloons in here today, right? And when you see a balloon, remind, remind yourself that God loves you, and when God loves you, always loves you when you see that love it, it can lift you up we put balloons in the church we put balloons in our lives because they're fun right because they make us happy when we have the love of god in our lives it lifts us up so i say this message god's help them god's helps those who help themselves that's that's something that we as christians we want to say no god help me so i want to help those around me because when i feel god's love it just feels so good and i want those around me to feel that good so we come to Ephesians, we see that, that God was talking about people who were insiders and outsiders, and God was reminding them, saying, hey, you once were outsiders, but I came to you, so now you go to them. And I'll read the scripture, right? It says, but God who is rich in mercy out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses. And that doesn't mean really dead, it just means that we felt alone, that we felt that we, felt that we were... We were all by ourselves. That God made us alive in Christ. I was explaining to Fiona this morning, praise God you lit the candles for us today. That was such a gift on Children's Sunday. I was explaining to her and her sister on what an important job alkylating is or lighting the candles. Um, I'm not big in, as, as the congregation knows, I don't really hold alkylating classes. We learn on the go, right? That's how we operate here at Grace. But isn't it awesome, right, when we have... Um, now, Fiona, she was a pro already because she's been paying attention to the other, the other kids doing it. But you've seen it, right? Right, brothers and sisters in Christ? You've seen it when, when a child comes up for the first time and they can barely hold up that, that candle. And I explain to them, I say, this represents the love of God in the world. And your job is to bring that light, that love of God to everyone in here. What an important job, Amen. Right? What an important job. And they come in and they, and they can't quite read it, reach that candle. And sometimes they have to lift them up and sometimes they have to hold their hands steady. Right? That's how it starts out, isn't it? Right? I have to hold them up. And then a few years before you know it, I just have to kind of support them or tell them to hold their hands a little lower. Right? And then, and then the next thing you know, they're running right up there, light it, and they're lighting it up and they're off. You see how they matured in the love of God in their... In their in this message of, of helping us by reminding us that the light of Christ dwells in each and every one of us. What an important job you guys have. What an important job. And to remind that when, we, when Earl snuffs out the candle and walks out with that Christ candle lit, that's a reminder that each and every one of you, each and every one of you is the light of Christ. Now to the one who works wages and not recognize gifts but as something due. But to one who without works trust him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. And they're just saying, this is that message of, of, of that God doesn't help those who help themselves. God, God just says, man, when, 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 when you're shining that light to everyone, you're a gift. You're a gift. I had this from last week. I'm going to skip it for the kids. 
And this is all the scripture that we did last week. And it says, remember that, that, that you were at times without Christ, being aliens, or being outsiders is the word. Depends on which translation of the Bible from the commonwealth of Israel. So they're talking about this area of, and I'm going to continue scripture. This is what we, we covered last week. We're talking about all the ways, very specific ways, how God reconciles us. I invite you, all you that um, weren't able to join us last week, I invite you to go to our YouTube channel and, and, and so you can see the message of how the price has been paid and all that's left for us is no longer, there's no more war left for us. There's only reconciliation when we accept Christ. That he abolishes, he abolishes the law, meaning that, that there's no more anything separating us, that we can come together and that he creates a new humanity. And in this new humanity, he creates brothers and sisters. Who here has brothers and sisters? Yeah. Quick story from Danielle. When mom was pregnant with Barry, she was so excited because she thought maybe she'd get a sister. And she was so excited, so excited. And then she found out it was a boy. She was a little let down. A little. <laughs> and then a, a couple of years later, mom and dad said to her, we're expecting a baby again. And she had no anticipation of excitement at all. She said, no. <laughs> she didn't care at that point if it was a brother or a sister. <laughs> Family. The church forgets the early movement. We get lost in the years of Constantine and all these different processes in the church. That was 300 years after Jesus. We started to complicate things. We forget that the church's message was this. I am your brother. You are my brother. I am your brother. You are my sister. That we are united as a family. And like all good families, we can fight sometimes, right? Sometimes we don't always get along, and sometimes we can upset each other. But we don't let go of each other, do we? Because Christ never lets go of you. The love of God, kids, has never, ever, ever let you down. Always loves you unconditionally. Unconditionally. And that is our call. If, you, if a pastor is calling you to any message, this is the message. Don't give up on each other. Love one another. And who was this message for when we filled our sheets out last week? Right? This is a peace that's giving, right? When we recognize that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, that we are now unified, that we are no longer insiders or outsiders, that we are one in the body. Who is this message for? You, me, us. So now what? So then, you are no longer strangers. You are no longer foreigners. You are citizens together in the household of God with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the cornerstone. This is not a past tense message, however. Yes, they are talking about what, how it's happening, but it can, has to continue to happen in you. It has to continue that we are the apostles and that as we proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, we become prophets. You know that's what a prophet is. A prophet is when you give a godly word to someone. When you say to someone that, hey, are you okay? Hey, I'm here for you. You're giving the good news of God. That's a prophet. That's a prophet message, and we're always centered in that light, like the alkalite, reminding us that candle, that that light of God is shining in us, and that light is cornerstone just means the perfect place to start, the perfect place to build on, and the perfect place to continue. The cornerstone is all important, and we don't have to say, I'm not good enough, or I'm not strong enough, or I'm not tall enough, right? Because we have, we have basketball players here and baseball players here, right? And soccer players and all these, and dancers. And, and sometimes we might feel like we're not tall enough or strong enough. But when you have the cornerstone to build on, you will continue to get stronger, right? You'll continue to get better. And you'll know that you're always in the grace of God. In Him, the whole structure. Now, remember guys, in that sheet I had last week, we filled the words in. The, the whole structure, 
Everything is built on this. Look at the world today. Is everything in our culture built on God? Or do we just like to throw God in on top of what we've already built? Let's think about that. Is God our cornerstone, our starting point in which we continue to build off of? Or are we building off of the things the world has told us to, and then once in a while we put a pinch of God on top of it? Right? No, God's structure, the cornerstone, Jesus Christ, is the entirety in which we build on. And then we say, how does our life stick to this vision that Christ had for us? Right? How do the decisions I make as I walk in this world, how are the decisions I make when I, when I have fellowship with others, is this sticking onto that cornerstone of Christ? For it grows into a holy temple. A holy temple. Notice it does not say a beautiful building. Notice it doesn't say a magnificent building, but rather a holy temple. And that holy temple is not made of hands, but rather of our Lord. It's in the Lord, and we dwell in the Lord. Are we a holy temple? Right? In whom you also are built together. A building will not stand unless you put, connect all the parts. You don't have to have a degree in engineering to realize that if you don't fasten it all together, the building will fall. And you can have the most holiest and pious individuals in the world. But unless we unite as brothers and sisters, the structure will not hold. And as holy as we may feel, it is not sound. I love this scripture in Ephesians. As I was exploring it with new eyes and a new heart, I see, I love this full context. I like that there's no little things being tossed. It's this whole message telling us, instructing us on how we can find the peace of God in our world today. We built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Are you a dwelling place for God? You see, when we become a dwelling place for God, I believe that when we stop the cornerstone of Jesus Christ in the building place, that there are no longer insiders and outsiders. There are no more of this us-them mentality. It takes that message of God helps those and who helps themselves and tosses it out the window. For rather, it brings us into a scriptural... This is in the Bible. It's in, it's in Matthew. And it's not just there, but it says, Do unto others that you would have do unto you. Treat others with respect. Treat others with, with compassion. Treat others with love. Treat others as, as you want to be treated. And I'm not talking about those silly things in the world, right? I'm not talking about trivializing the scripture. I'm talking about all the important things, right? I want to be treated with dignity. Raise a hand, right? Don't you? I want to be heard. I want to be heard even when I'm wrong. <laughs> and maybe... Maybe as we hear and listen to others, we can start meeting them in love rather than conflict. Do unto others as they have done unto you. We're not talking about those areas of darkness. We're talking about the areas that are so important. So yesterday when we're at the event, I was making the rounds and talking to... Um, a, a woman that had a booth set up. She was from just outside of Boston. She came a long way to be with us. And, and she was um, talking about our ministry. She was comparing, and not comparing, it was a good thing. I don't mean it sound negative. We were just sharing all the different things. And she said, I heard you have, you know, a church in, uh, in the numbers around 40, and ours is two, and what are you guys doing? And, and, and I, you know, I shared some things. I said, well, just, just find why, why you're here, right? She asked, like, what, what do you guys do? I said, well, find why we're here. Why does Grace United Methodist Church exist at 10 Park Ave, right? Why, why, why do people see, how, how do people see the holiness of this area? And then she started sharing about youth ministries because she saw the activities that were going on outside. And she said to me, what, what do you think the key to your youth ministry is? I said, well, every year it's more and more successful. And how do we judge success? And I said, that, I, said I, think, I think Grace lives by one simple rule. And I said, in, in an annual conference, Michelle and Mike, you heard, we had this conversation at annual conference when they had the new youth director at Aldersgate, I think, might not have been Aldersgate, they had a new youth director, and, and the person said, I believe the children are the future of the church. And you heard it, right? It wasn't just me, it was a few people that went, ugh. And I was one of them, I'm like, no, no, the children, you guys aren't the future of the church. 
The future of the church doesn't bring in the light of Christ and remind us of what it's like to be on fire for God. The future of the church doesn't come up here and dance proclaiming like David. David was so excited about God, he started dancing. No, only people of now can do that. You are the church now, right? Now, I know we look to the future with wondrous eyes and amazement on what else you're going to do. But don't let anyone ever tell you you're the future of the church. You are the living church today doing magnificent things, proclaiming the good news of God. Amen? Amen. That's the secret. And as long as we continue to look at our children as the church today, treating them with the same respect that we want to be treated with, talking to them the same way we want to be spoken to, lifting them up as they lift us up, then this church will continue to strive. I shared with you a message years ago where this church had this poster up and it said, Save our church. Who is going to go to a church like that? I don't know about you, I go to church to be saved. That's too big of a burden, right? If we put on the banner at the side and said, save our church. No, we come to be saved. We are the church today, amen? We are the church today. Doesn't matter your age. Doesn't matter if your physical abilities. Doesn't matter if you're tall enough or, too sh or if you're short enough. All things through Christ Jesus. Big things happen in small groups. Right? Big things happen, even though sometimes we're not tall enough to go on the ride. Right? Big things happen. Happen. The church is not passive. The church is not irrelevant. The church isn't waiting, just simply waiting, rather, for the coming of perfection in this world. But God is calling you each and every one of you to be something big in our small little groups. Amen? Amen. Amen. So as we hear the good news of our Savior calling us to be the holy temple of God, may this message not be a period when I say amen. Amen is not the ending. It's not, the, it's not that point where you say you move on, even though in preaching I tell people, if you don't know what else to say, say Amen. Amen means I believe. And if you believe in something, truly believe in something, then this message cannot stop today. Right, guys? This message has to move on because we believe it. Amen? Amen. Amen.